Okay, so welcome back. Um, and so the last session is going to be, the last two speakers is actually going to be focused on applications of machine learning to kind of cutting edge areas in the sciences. So we'll hear about quantum mechanics and we'll hear about astrophysics. So our next speaker will be telling us about um, data-driven perspective on quantum physics of many particles. And our, our next speaker is Giacomo Torlai from the um, Center for Computational Quantum Physics at the Flatiron Institute. Um, this is this new institute in New York City that's focused on applying computation and data sciences, including machine learning, um, to different areas of science, including quantum physics. Um, Giacomo got his PhD in physics from um, University of Waterloo and the Perimeter Institute. And he was really one of the um, earliest people in our subfield of quantum physics to apply machine learning tools to these problems where people weren't sure if these tools could even help you at all. Like, how would you even apply it? And he was kind of a pioneer in, in doing that. So, um, Giacomo. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. And thanks for organizing this, this great event. Um, I had the pleasure of talking to many of you yesterday and, and today, and it has been great. And so I hope you're having fun. And personally, I'm very thrilled to tell you this story about some of the recent developments between uh, physics and machine learning. And in particular, as an application, I will tell you how to, how to harness and how to use the speed of algorithms to tackle some complex problems in quantum many-body physics. And these problems, uh, they involve quantum systems, which comprise a large number of elementary constituents, right? And these elementary degrees of freedom interact uh, with each other. So this could be particles. Uh, so like in Kiron's talk, there could be electrons in some molecules or it could be a cloud of atoms, but there could also be some quantum bits in one of these quantum processors that they're building these days, right? So interaction, you could imagine some circuit running a specific algorithm. And, but yeah, for the rest of the talk, I will focus on condensed matter physics. And, and condensed matter is itself a very broad uh, field and studies quantum matter and materials. And I'd say one of the, one of the areas of particular interest and sees a lot of research efforts is the study of uh, physics of matter, right? So liquid and gas, these are two examples, but there are, there are many more. And, and some questions are, you know, under which condition a certain type of material can display a certain phase? Uh, what's, what's the nature of the transition between two phases? And, you know, are there, uh, are there phases that do not occur naturally in materials, as far as we know, but we can engineer in the lab? And, and if so, what can we do with them? Uh, are they useful for something? And I want to spend a few words on, on this. And I guess the, the starting point is, is this. This is a phase diagram of water. And I'm sure uh, all of you thought this. And as in phase diagrams, we have parameters. And as we change these parameters, a material can behave differently. And here we have temperature and pressure. And at room temperature, water molecule in a liquid state, as we cool down uh, the, the material at some critical temperature, uh, it becomes energetically favorable, favorable for molecules to form bonds and, and crystallize in a solid state, right? This is a phase transition from liquid to, to solid. And, and this type of phase diagram is very common, but, but there, are, there are different type of phases, right? Depend on what you're looking for. And, and you know, this is the special structure, but another example that we can experience every day are magnetic phases, right? And, so if you consider the refrigerator, refrigerator magnet that, that you have, and this type of material, they are ferromagnetic, right? And what this means in a very, very cartoonish way is that all the magnetic dipoles in the atoms in your, in your, in your material, uh, below a certain temperature, if this material is ferromagnetic, they want to align and point in the same direction. And this generates a macroscopic magnetic field. That's what you know, allows you to stick the magnets in the fridge. And and so what happens here if what's the parameter, for example? And one thing you can do, you can start like raising the temperature and you know, um, thermal fluctuation, the, the effect of uh, the heat is to start disaligning some of these spins, right? Or magnetic dipole, let's call them spins. And what happens is that when you cross a certain critical temperature, there is just too much, just too, too much thermal fluctuations, right? And, and at some point, that are just, just too much agitation and the, the, the material demagnetized. And so you, can try, you shouldn't try this. I mean, if, uh, this critical temperature is very high, like hundreds of Kelvin, like maybe a thousand. But I was looking and I found this material, this element, gadolinium, at a Curie temperature, that's a transition temperature, is room temperature. 
And you can find it on Amazon. I wanted to buy, but there was no Amazon Prime, so I couldn't get it in time. <laughs> but I believe that this is, should be a magnet, and uh, you know, if you hold it your end long enough, it should demagnetize, so it's not radioactive or anything. So. And OK, so these are kind of conventional phases that we can experience, but but there are an entire zoo of different phases of matter, and, and they can be bizarre and, and spooky. And this is what happens usually when quantum mechanics is involved. And, and to enter this regime, typically, we have to lower the temperature when quantum mechanical effect becomes, becomes predominant. And one important example is superconductivity. And so this was discovered 100, 100 years ago. And in some, some material, like, like mercury or metals, um, so essentially, we know that uh, we just, in the, for these materials, we just need to provide a little kick of energy, and the electrons can leave the atoms and flow through the, through the material, generating a current, right? And we all know that there is an intrinsic resistance, right? There are these tightly packed crystal of atoms, there are thermal fluctuation again, so as we provide some energy to this material in a form of an electric field, some of this energy is lost. There is dissipation, there is heating. And as we decrease the temperature, this resistance decreases as well. And at some critical temperature, it's just dropped to zero. And what happens is that the, there is a phase transition from a metallic state to a superconducting state. And in the superconducting state, electrons flow through the material without losing energy. And this is a big deal, right? You know, for, for like, it has an like a, like a important impact uh, in our like, everyday life, right? And so hundreds of years ago, um, there is a catch. And the catch is that the temperature where this happens is very, very low. It's 4 Kelvin. That's minus 270 uh, Celsius. So it, this is, you know, we, we can realize this, but we just, just need to this very, very low temperature. So we need li liquid helium, typically, to get to those temperatures. And you know, higher is like, very, very expensive. So we cannot we can scale this to a real, you know, so cool down power lines and, and, and something like that. Uh, this is not the end of the story, though. And like 60 years later, around there, then another type of superconductivity was discovered. This is referred to high temperature superconductivity. And uh, the, 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 the transition temperature where this type of material becomes superconductor is substantially higher. It's still low. We're talking about 100, 150 Kelvin, but it's substantially higher than conventional superconductors. And, and one important point is that the the microscopic mechanism behind this type of superconductivity is different from conventional superconductor. Those we understand. The theory was, in the, it was formulated in the 50s. And we understand the mechanism. But the highest temperature is like something like 30 Kelvin. And this is a whole different type of, of physics. Okay? And, and this is, a, I would say, like one of the biggest unsolved challenge of, of condensed matter. Because if we, if we can solve this problem, then there is hope that we can, we can find materials which can display superconductivity at room temperature. Okay? And one of the problems that, uh, that prevent us to solve this, this, this problem uh, is that the, the electrons in this material, they, they possess very strong interactions. And quite generally, when you're going to try to solve quantum mechanics when for a large number of particles, you're going to find an intrinsic complexity just by having a large number of particles interacting. And when the interactions are strong, uh, things get much, much worse. Right? When they are weakly interacting, you can circumvent this problem. And the interaction uh, grows strong, you can find a way to overcome it. But that's one of the cases where uh, we haven't found a way to, to solve this, uh, this problem. And so at this point, I'd like to uh, explain a little bit more in detail what I mean with this intrinsic complexity. And so what also Kieran refers to the, the many-body problem like we face in, in quantum many-body physics. And I, I think it's, a, you know, it's, it's probably good to define a bit what a quantum state is. And I'll do it for the simplest possible case of one particle. And let's consider, you know, let's, stick to, let's stick to electrons. Uh, and let's strip away everything except the magnetic uh, moment. So that's a very simplistic case, but, but it makes the point, right? So, this object is quantum mechanical, and this, this property is quantized. That's an intrinsic property of particles. And electrons, they possess a, a spin, and the spin can be up or it can be down. Now, the question is, how do we characterize the state of an electron, right? 
And you know, when you enter the scale of atoms, particles, molecules, the microscopic scale, then physics is substantially different from what we are used to, right? From, from the physics that we experience in, at the human scale. And one, one, one important property is that there is an intrinsic randomness when you look at the like, matter and nature at this scale. So there is a, if, we, if we measure this property, if we take this electron and measure its spin, we're going to find that the spin is pointing up with some probability and is pointing down with some other probability. And this is, a, this is, a, it is exactly an intrinsic uncertainty. It's not about ignorance. And I'll come back to that. And so the most general way to write down the state of an electron in this case is called a wave function. And the wave function, essentially, this is a most general form, and it tells you essentially uh, everything uh, that you need to know about this type of measurement. Uh, it's expressed as a two different coefficients, one for the state up and one for the state down. And these coefficients are related to the probability that you would found that outcome if you measure, right? So those are the square. And this intrinsic uncertainty resides in this principle, which is called superposition. So the, the electron can be found in a superposition of these two states. And superposition itself is kind of a, like a hard concept. We don't have any, any counterpart in, in the classical world. So I'll try to make an example to make it clear. Hopefully it will be clear, or, or I will confuse you even more, we'll see. <laughs> so, uh, let's consider equal amplitude superposition, right? That means that uh, the electron is simultaneously in the state up and down with equal probability, one half, okay? And one way to think about this, because you know, what does it mean to be in the same state simultaneously, right? So imagine to write the, to imagine this state as two waves, at two different frequencies, and then you can think about the wave function as the sum of these two waves. So if you look at this, you can see that the two states are simultaneously present in the, in the wave function with, with equal probability. Right? This is a cartoonish way, definitely uh, inaccurate. But, but the point is that you can have these two states at the same time. Now, we can see this in practice. In practice, what we actually see is a black box. We can look at the wave function. <laughs> so what you can do at this point, you, you can ask a question. You can make a measurement. And when the state is in this superposition and you make a measurement, you can find one state. And this is what is say, the, the collapse of the wave function without equal probability. And you can then find the other state with the same probability. But let me make a thing clear. There is no, there is no ignorance, as I said. Um, this is intrinsic randomness. Uh, um, because I hear sometimes, you know, if you only knew all the information about the state, then you could predict the outcome with certain probabilities. Just that uh, you miss information. That's not, that's not what happens, right? There is. There are no hidden variables to be found. This is what the, was the critique uh, from Einstein. There are no hidden variables to be found. There is nobody keeping track of the state of the electron. There is no record. Um, the state hasn't been, like, it's just been in this, in this, in this uh, uh, counterintuitive uh, superposition. And, and so this is one important point about quantum states. And another consequence of the superposition is that if you want to write the wave function for one electron, you're going to need two different uh, numbers, the amplitudes for the state up and the amplitude for the state down, because it can be found in this, in this superposition. So if you want to store this state and somewhere on your computer and then retrieve it one year from now, you're going to need to insert uh, two numbers just in a text file. Imagine something like that. And if you, now if you consider two electrons, what happens then? Well, Two electrons, they have four possible states, right? Up, up, down, up, up, down, and down, down, right? But this is still a quantum mechanical object, so the wave function for the two electrons can be spread over all these four states simultaneously. So if we want to store this state, we're going to need to provide four numbers, or write down four numbers. What about three? Again, eight possible states, eight numbers. I guess you know where I'm going with this. If you keep increasing these n, n electrons, 2 to the n numbers. Uh, now, that's a big number. And, and so essentially, you can imagine that if you want to store the wave function, you have this very long list of numbers that can be positive and negative. That can also be complex, but let's just keep it uh, real. And so 
So TN is big, but how big, right? Okay, I'll try to put things in perspective, always helps me somehow. Um, for the electrons, that's, you know, that's uh, not small, not, definitely not big, but if I want to store a wave function for 40 electrons, I'm gonna need a 10 terabyte hard drive. Okay, well, you can get it, you can buy it, it's not super cheap, but, <laughs> but that's fine. <laughs> what about 56 electrons? Well, I'm gonna need to buy one of these big container and I'm gonna have to fill it with 88,000 hard drive. I guess it's, you know, you can probably mm, have some more cost efficient way, but what about 70 electrons? 70 electrons, uh, I believe this is the biggest ship container in the world, 21,000 containers, and again, you know where I'm going, 90 electrons, you have to line up one million ships, that's as much space as from the Earth to the Moon, full of containers, full of hard drives, full of numbers. 300 electrons is the number of atoms in the universe, 2 to the 10 to the 23 electrons, it's a mole, well, I don't know even what is that, right? So, I mean, what are we doing, right? What, what, what's going on? This is just definitely, <laughs> definitely an exploding, infinite complexity, okay? Uh, I didn't tell you the worst part. Uh, I didn't tell you how to find the wave function, and just if I give it to you, that's how hard it is to store it somewhere, but you have to find it first. And to do that, you have to solve the Schrodinger equation. And what is this essentially is, you know, you have, you have a microscopic model, that's H, we call it the Hamiltonian, and this contains the property of the single particle and how these particles interact, okay? That's, those are the, the rule of the game, if you want. And you want to go from H to find the wave function. That's a, that's a state of this many particle system satisfying the rule of the, the microscopic model. And this is felt if a very, it's, it's also an exponential problem, okay? So since the formulation of quantum theory, this has been treated uh, using calculus and, and this works very well also is works perfectly if you don't have interaction and works uh, fairly well for weak interaction, but, but typically breaks down for strongly correlated system. That's what we call them. And so what we do at and, and CCQ and, and, and in, our, in our institute is that we apply a computational approach, right? So what we do is we try to, to encode this problem in some computer code, and we run this code in this very large supercomputer, maybe for one day, sometimes for a month, a colleague of mine in Warloo ran a code for almost two years, then you're gonna get a number, maybe more than one, and this is your answer, right? And so there are different ways to approach this, but there is a naive way to say, okay, well, I'll just do a brute force. I just take this microscopic model, I know how to solve it, this is just linear algebra, essentially. It's a fairly simple way, that's what Kieran was saying, we know how to solve this, this, this equation. And if you try doing so, well, that's me trying to do so, and uh, I get to 16 electrons in this amount of time. Uh, if I get a bit more clever, I can get to 26. I think the record is 50, but not, the, not how this grows linearly, but then not the log scale, so this is exponential. So if you add one electron, then it becomes twice. You know, it's like, it's, it's, you, can, you can deal with that, right? So, so I'm just gonna flash now a few strategies. That, that, that the community employ, that's, that's one, that's DFT that we heard this morning. And a different strategy is using a compression. And essentially, uh, the, the idea is that, well, we have 300 electrons and the wave function is as big as the, you need as many atoms in the universe. I mean, but then you look at the macroscopic physics and it's not, you know, it's like, it's, 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 uh, it doesn't seem that complex. Uh, so maybe, maybe there is some redundancy, maybe, Maybe quantum states, you don't need that many number uh, to treat them. And you know, this is indeed the case in many situations. And you, you can compress this quantum state from this exponential mass to something which is, you know, polynomial, say. And, and this is what Miles is, uh, is an expert in. And it is a fully, treated on a fully quantum problem, right? There is other approaches and one say, well, I have this quantum system uh, maybe two electrons moving, and I have this exponential scaling, and I can't treat it. But then you think, well, if the system were classical, the system was classical, I know how to solve that. I know, I know, the, I have this powerful algorithm, but then when it becomes quantum mechanical, this breaks down. So maybe I can find a way to transform this problem into something which is classical, and then solve that problem. And you can do this, I know it sounds funny, but you add an extra dimension, and these quantum particles become like strings in this higher dimensional space and you can, you can solve for this problem. Now both 
the compression technique and map into a classical system as well as DFT and many others, they have their strength and they have their limitation. And for example, this ITC, superconductivity, is one of the cases where uh, none of this technique can reliably find a solution to the, to the microscopic problem. And of course, there are other paths, and one was suggested by Feynman, say, well, naturally is quantum mechanical, use quantum mechanics to solve it. And so we heard before, too, what you can do is that you try to solve some real quantum matter, and you use a quantum computer to do so. And this is a simulation that I ran in one of these small quantum computers, simulation of magnetism, and this is the real solution, the one, it's not, nothing unsolved, I knew what the answer was. And this is the solution that they got using this uh, quantum computer with three different types of simulations. So it's, it kind of works at the beginning, but then as it starts going bad, and this is because, as we were saying before, these devices are noisy. You don't have error correction. And we do have error correction in classical computer, and it works very well, but this is not, we are not yet there. So it, there are things you can do with these devices, but, 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 but we, are not, we, are not, we can use it for, like, large-scale quantum simulation just yet. And these are like five qubits. So it's not really large scale after all. Um, another paradigm, which is I'm, I'm more interested in, and, and this is more related to, to machine learning, is what I would say quantum emulation. That is, well, I have this real quantum material. I can solve it, and I have limited control on the type of measurement I can do in it. Maybe I can find some synthetic material that I can build in the lab which has the same microscopic physics, right? but I can control, I have a high degree of control in it, so I can perform very specialized measurement, and I can tweak, and I have all these knobs, and I can explore regimes where maybe they're not accessible in the, in the real material. And the point is that by doing so, so it's like you're not solving the Schrodinger equation. Essentially, you're asking this to solve it for you. You're asking nature to solve the Schrodinger equation. You don't want to calculate psi, the wave function. You, you just let it solve itself. And then, well, then the problem doesn't just disappear, right? Yeah, then you have to find a way to extract it. Yeah. So uh, this means doing some measurement. And measurements means having data. And, and so the problem now, it's, it's just being rephrased. It doesn't disappear. Uh, now we have to to find a way to extract physics from data. So that's where all this machine learning and quantum manipulative physics, they, they come together. And so let me tell you a little bit about, about that. Uh, physics from data, such a good news, right? Well, I mean, people have been doing that for a long time, I'd say, like, can, yes? Can I just ask, so are you talking about like cold atoms? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I, will, I will go a little bit in detail in like a few slides, yeah. So data-driven physics, I'll for, forget the quantum for a moment, a uh, new thing, no, well, look at this guy, Tycho Brahe, he was like 1500, and he sat down and he looked at the stars for a long time, and he filled on this table. Position of the planets, position of the stars, okay? And the, these are called rule of fine tables, I believe. And, and th this data led to the Kepler laws. So Kepler uh, finished this table and he was looking at it, and, and he found patterns in this, in this, in this data. And, the, and he came up with the, the Kepler's law by that. So that's impressive, right? Uh, 500 years ago. Other example, well, uh, there was data that, that there was, let's say, a part of the puzzle that led that, that to a formulation of quantum theory. And in particular, this gentleman, Rutherford, uh, he, he proposed a model of atom, which had a massive nucleo, nucleus, and the electrons were orbiting around, OK? And, and this model had some problems, and one of the problems is that the electromagnetic radiation emitted by the atom, uh, if you consider this model, should be continuous. This, these are the frequency that are the light emitted by the atoms. But when you do an experiment and you look at it, you find something like that. Okay? There are specific lines, a specific frequency. So something is wrong, right? And so some people, Balmer, Lehman, and, and Riberg also, I think, they, find, they found a way to to predict the position of this line very, very accurately, doing some, like, uh, some empiric formula. And this then suggested that, indeed, the, the structure of the atoms is something more like that, right? There are uh, discrete energy levels, and then this line, they, they correspond to, to transition of electrons from one level to another. So that's why they are discrete, and they can only assume certain values. Okay. 
So let's fast forward to today. Okay, so this is something like this, this highly controlled experiment. I, I thought it was some kind of storage at uh, first. <laughs> I couldn't believe it, but, but then now this is the real deal. And I was at the time in Munich where most of these experiments were done and I visited these labs and I was, I was amazed by what, what, what we, we could do, what we could achieve. And, and what they could do is they could cool down clouds of atoms and achieve essentially single atom control. So you can see here, this is a, this is, these are atoms, like laser-cooled atoms, okay? And those are very sophisticated experiments. And, well, you can do more than that. You can actually draw things. So these are single atoms, believe it or not, and I could not at first say, wow, like, this is impressive. They can actually not only measure, but, but control the single atom, and, and this, uh, you know, this uh, provides very, very exciting possibility because you can probe quantum mechanics at its core, right? And so this is the data that I'm refer referring to, right? This is the, the quantum data. And clearly here, there is nothing very deep going on. Here people, they just arrange this atom in some periodic structure. But then you could say, well, I can engineer this synthetic quantum matter in this lab, which maybe emulates some other material I'm interested in, or maybe just for the sake of exploring. And then I can make these very refined measurements, and this measurement will give me an insight on the physics, right? If, I, if, I'm, if I'm looking for a wave function, that's where I'm going to find it. And so it's not going to be something like that. It's going to be something like this. This is a simulation I ran the other day. It's, you have spins. Um, and they, are, they have this single state that Kiron said. These are like highly entangled state, and this thing fluctuates, as this is related to one of these topological phases of matter, which is like very exotic and, and interacting, strongly interacting. And what we can do really with uh, what Tycho Brahe did, right? I can highball this and, and hopefully to find, hope to find the wave function. It's, but it's there, right? It's just hidden in some non trivial way in this data. So that's what I mean when the problem is offloaded. Well, this I simulated because I knew how to, but imagine going into, lab, into a lab, doing a measurement, getting something like this, and all, everything is encoded inside this data. And so what, you know, are we equipped to, to, to extract this information? That's the question, right? And that's where, that's where machine, learning, machine learning comes into play. And I mean, we are here. Uh, in, in the previous talk, uh, a very good explanation of, of what's going on, and in, in I, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna walk through a couple of applications if I think I can with time, of uh, that's very recent very recent works on how we can obtain some information that was previously not available using machine learning. Okay, so the question is the first question is can we validate or reject theories from measurement data? Okay. And this is related to this uh, high temperature superconductivity. So this is a bit the physics part, and I'll just briefly describe it. And this is, again, um, this is a platform that allows you to probe this type of physics. Now, they can reach temperature like low enough to enter in the superconducting state, but they're getting closer. And so the idea is that Okay, we have, we have the electrons in this, they're called cuprates material. Those are like these crystals, and they have this high, temp high temperature superconductivity. And then we want to do something which mimics this physics. So first we need the crystal. And these are called optical lattice, this crystal of light. So they, they, they shine two counter-propagating laser beams. There is an interference, a static pattern appears. And so essentially, these are like a patterns which mimics the, the potential that electrons feel inside crystals, okay? So you don't want to use electrons, you want to use atoms, you have more control over them. And so what they do is that they load this mixture of lithium atoms, two different states for these atoms, uh, one for spin up and spin down, and they load these atoms into this lattice. So the idea is that they are two uh, tra um, trapped into two dimensions, and those, they should behave like electrons in this lattice. So as the same way as electrons, these atoms can move around, they have kinetic energy. And the same way as electrons, these atoms interact, they are charged as charged particles, so you have Coulomb interaction. But because electrons obey Pauli exclusion, exclusion principle, this, this, the 
in a situation where two atoms with the same spin are in the same position, that's forbidden. And so that's why they use lithium atoms, because those are fermions, and fermions obey these statistics. And so you do this, you see this is kind of the, how the experiment works. You have this 2D, you have these two type of atoms moving around, and then they can, they can record images, and then you get something like that. So these are, these are the atoms. This is just a grid, but this is the real picture of what's going on there. And this is the data that we want to, we want to use well, uh, to, to essentially yeah, uh, understand the physics. Okay? And so this is a problem that we are not able to solve using any of the techniques that I said before. In a particular regime, there are no, uh, no algorithms that allow us to, to, to uh, understand, uh, understand this physics. Um, in like a reliable way. However, you know, we still, and there are still like many theories that have been proposed to explain this phenomena. And so imagine having two theories, okay? And so these two theories, and don't mind what they are. They are two different theories. They, they, the goal is to explain the physics that they realize in this platform. And using these two theories, you can generate images such as like this, right? And they're going to be different. I just, this is just a cartoon picture, OK? And so we have two images. They have belong to two different theories. And we have seen this before, right? That's the same thing of cats and dogs, OK? So the question is, can we build, can we build a, and train a neural network which is able to distinguish images from these two theories. And, and the images are just uh, where the atoms are. That's very simple, OK? So we can use a neural network. And as before, we have an input layer. And these are going to be each, say, position in this grid, and say 1 if there is an atom, and 0 if there are no atoms. Then we have uh, some more or less complicated network with some weights that we're going to adjust. And we're going to have two outputs. I mean, I could have had one because it's like a binary, but you know, we're going to have two. Uh, it's like a bit more parameters here. I haven't done this. Uh, this is a, uh, an experiment that has not been done in our group, but they used two. And essentially, this tells you what's the probability that some image here belongs to theory one, and what's the probability that belongs to theory two. Okay, And we know these are probability. They sums to one. So the, that's essentially the same strategy that we've seen before for the rectangles and the strategy that we have seen for the natural images. Okay? And so ideally, what we want is that we feed an image of theory 1, we propagate the signal, and then we get some confidence. Say 96%, then this image is, was produced using theory 1. And we can do the other way around, and we need the, like, com the good confidence that this, uh, this neuron lights up. Okay? And so this is done by training the network. I, I don't want to go into detail, but I just tell you once again the kind of the philosophy. And the point is we want to find a set of weights which realize these two conditions that I showed before. And as you initialize this network and you propagate the signal, you're going to get something like that, something like you know, half and half or, or, or something which is wrong. And you know, this is the right answer. So what you want to do, you want to take these weights and change them by using this calculus rule, so that at the next iteration, this number increase. Okay? And you do it again and again. Okay? And suppose that you succeed in this task, and then you got a network that can reliably distinguish these two theories. Now what you can do is that you can feed the experimental data. Okay? And you can ask, well, what's the theory of this data? Okay? Is it theory 1? Or theory two, okay. That's what they did in this. That's very recent. It's a few months ago, and these are the results. This are, is a, one of the these parameters that you tune in this phase diagram. Essentially, when when we are here, we have in average one atom per this grid point, and when we move away, we are essentially removing atoms. And here we can we understand what's going on. And as you move there, all this kind of simulation that we do breaks down. And this is the regime where the material becomes superconducted. It's, it, it needs a lower temperature, so we are not crossing this boundary with the superconductivity, but that's the regime that we can solve. And so what the network does, it tells that you know, in this low doping regime, the theory one, the geometric things, I don't mind this too much, uh, 
explains the data, but uh, and theory two uh, less, and this seems to cross, although there is not very much confidence there. Okay, and so why does this provide more information than previous attempt? And the point is that uh, they were done. Um, you know, you could do the same uh, without a neural network. You could find some uh, some some way to probe this, right? Maybe you want to compare some measurement that you did, but then by doing so, you're introducing bias. You're saying, are, are these data from this theory and this theory according to my metric? And if we don't fully understand what's the correct metric to use, so we're gonna get something which is unreliable. And in fact, using the metrics, for example, correlation function, they weren't able to distinguish with good certainty which theory was explaining uh, the data, but this seems to provide like at least a more confident uh, answer, uh, which is which is great. And okay, so um, you can build a classifier essentially to distinguish between two different theories, but then we can go a little bit farther, right? And we say, well, can we use the neural network not to tell which theory the data resembles more, but to tell me directly the quantum state of the data. Okay, that's what I've been working on in particular. And in the, you know, rephrasing the previous talk, what Yasman was saying is the one that I just showed you is supervised learning. You have data, the images of the atoms, and you have labels, the theories. I want to do unsupervised learning. I want to I don't care about the table, I don't have the theories anymore. I just show the data and I want to understand the, the, the structure of the data, which is the wave function, okay? So that's what we had before. We had some, some experimental wave function, which we don't know, but it's there. By name, so that's, that's, that's what the state of the plot, the simulator is. And we do measurements and then we feed to the network and it tells which theory is more likely. Now we want to do something different. We want to have the, the same process here, feed to the data and tell us the wave function. And the wave function can be related to the probability distribution uh, on this uh, input layer. So instead of saying, what's the probability of this theory given an image, I want to know what's the probability of the image. And so maybe this connection is not obvious. There is much more to be said, but Remember what I said in, like, in the previous slides that the probability of measuring some state was the square of the coefficient of the wave function, right? And so this is what I want to measure here. If I have access to the distribution, then I get access to this coefficient. So I'm learning the wave function. So there is a catch, and that is I'm doing a, s a square here. So. Uh, we can, we can, it's a, it's a bit more involved, but we can, we can distinguish even like positive and negative coefficient. It's just a bit more, uh, more complicated. But say, you know, this is kind of the, the philosophy behind. Right? We can relate, we can relate this, this coefficient to the probability distribution of the data, but we can learn this probability distribution. That's what these neural networks do using unsupervised learning. Okay, and I'm gonna show you an example. Now we are actively working with experiments. I, this is a very a work in progress. And so I'm not, I don't have like mm, results uh, to show for that, but I can show you something that we, we, we calculated last year. And this is all synthetic data, meaning that that was, that was us that generated the data in the first place using the computer. It's just like a feedback that we generate the data. So we generate the wave function, we do the measurement. So we simulate the measurement process then we reconstruct the wave function and we compare back, right? That's what you do when you invent, like a, uh, you, you develop a new algorithm, you check its validity in some known cases. And so this is a wave function for 12 electrons. And now I'm gonna explain what this is. 12, 2 to the 12, 4,000 coefficients, right? From here to there. Remember the big vector? Okay, so it doesn't fit 4,000, okay? So I, I plot it in this way, I know it can be confusing. These are not the position of the atoms anymore. This is the wave function, okay? This is what it is. You start from here and you say, well, I have a grid. This is coefficient one. This is coefficient two, three, four. You see there are eight, eight times eight, 64, 64 squared, 40,000, okay? And the color is what's the value of the coefficient. I'll let that sink in for a 
like uh, mirrors. So that's a way to visualize the wave function. Uh, and you know, 12 electrons, it's a bit underwhelming. I've been telling you, you know, <laughs> we can do it like exactly. Yes, but again, we did, we went up to 150, which depends who you ask. If you ask me, that's large, but not depends uh, again who you ask. But uh, but this is just you know to to, to show you how, how this can uh, how this work. And and so we this is the wave function um, for all the possible states of this electron system. And then we perform measurements on it. Uh, I'm not, I don't have the measurements here, but those are just one and zero, like bit of string, strings, strings of bit of one and zero, and you have 12 of them, and one measure, two measure, thousand measure, et cetera. You feed this to a neural network, you apply this algorithm, and you ask, what's the wave function from the data? And this is the result, okay? Did I just copy paste this year? <laughs> can you spot can you can you spot some difference? Yeah. There are there are you can if you look close enough. So yeah, this is uh, almost closed. Here is open. Okay, so it's not, it's, it's true. Okay. Um, so the neural network is the wave function here essentially, and this is also connected to this compression mechanism because what you've done, you've done two things. You haven't solved the Schrodinger equation. You, well, we did in the first place. But imagine you have an experiment. You let that solve, then you extract the wave function using machine learning, uh, this unsupervised learning. And on top of it, you use a neural network as a compression technique. Because now we don't have two to the n parameters anymore, but we have as many weights in the network. That's where the wave function is encoded. So I could just, I could have done it actually. I could have just plot the same square, but just with the value of the parameters, and that would you know, encode the same information, would be the same. So I guess that's a, kind of the, the philosophy behind this. Okay, so I'm gonna conclude. Um, I would say there are, there are a, lot of, uh, a lot of interesting problems in condensed matter. Uh, I, just, I just talked a little bit about superconductivity, but there are many more exotic phases of matter that we don't understand. And a neural network here can really, really play, play an important role to, from a phenomenological perspective, they can allow us to explore this regime of physics that we don't fully understand yet. And we can harness this data that is available today, and this is becoming uh, a reality. And 10 years ago, we didn't possess the, this high quality data, but now we do. I'm gonna have more and more data. So I envision there could be a shift in the paradigm, in the paradigm that we, 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 do, uh, we do science because we have this data and, and we should make good use of it. But this is not the end of the story, there is much more. Uh, surely this is an application, but, but now we, all, we, all, we have all this new quantum processor and quantum hardware and neural networks can provide a sort of uh, analytics, right? I have, I have this chip, and it's doing something quantum. How do I know, right? So maybe I can run an algorithm. I know what's a, what's a state that need to be, need to produce, and then I can use neural networks to to just check, to just see that the state that is generated is the correct one, to just see what is going on here. And ultimately, we have also been working on applying this neural network to perform quantum error correction. That's what is gonna make quantum computers, uh, say, useful, I guess, uh, in the long term. I, not, not the neural network we make, the quantum correction is its own field, and there are many, many different techniques. That's just the last two in the toolbox. But, but this is still a bit down the road, but you know, that's another type of application where you can use data uh, to, to do physics. And I think I, I conclude right here. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Giacomo, for a really uh, clear talk. Can we have a question over here? This is a simple question for me. Is there quantum computers? Or, or we, do we really have one here? I mean, not here, but... Well, <laughs> funny you say, because actually in Santa Barbara, that's that they're building, currently they're building one, and that's uh, from the Google team. Um, so there are... There are quantum computers, and oh, I forget to thank you for the question because I wanted to see, but I forgot. 
there is this thing called IBM Q experience and I suggest you all to go and check it out. Then you can make an account and, and you, can, you can literally run your algorithm on a real quantum computer. I'm not kidding, yeah, this is <laughs> IBM Q experience. You can run it for as long as you want, of course. You have tokens, and you can you can just build some simple algorithm, design a circuit, and just play around with it. And that's the service that I use to to do that little simulation that I showed you in the talk. I just register, I use some token, I draw a circuit, and I simulate like a small quantum magnet using using the circuit. Clearly, the simulation degrade pretty I don't know if, uh, pretty quickly. Um, but it was still very interesting to do that. I guess it's here. Yeah, so that was the chip that I use. The five cube. Yeah, the talk is 170 megabytes, so every time I go from one to the other. <laughs> uh, five qubits, yeah. Uh, I simulated five quantum spins interacting, uh, and this is the result. But again, it's noisy, so you can run a very long algorithm. It's pretty cool, eh? Mm -hmm. Yes? If you go back to the second, it's a very naive question, just for, mm -hmm. for me to get clarity. If you can go back to the second last slide that you showed with the actual uh, wave function on the left, mm -hmm. right. and then the neural wave function. Mm -hmm. So, um, So the wave function on the left, that is really a photograph that was made from the lithium atoms? No, no, no. So this is, sorry, maybe I should have made that clear. This that is it was, uh, is there any connection between the no. instrument you had there and the lithium atoms? No, that no, the lithium right. atoms was the previous experiment. Um, and that's what I was uh, for the supervised learning part. And this is just uh, 12 electrons. And that's just a simulated data. So uh, this was, um, it was, it was a real electron. It's more like a quantum spins, and which has the same property, but I didn't, I didn't have anti uh, Pauli exclusion principle there. They were in different space. And they were, were moving like a spin chain. And this was like a time evolution of the spin chain. And this was after some time that the, the system was evolved, and it took the wave function there. But doesn't, it's not related to the lithium atoms, no. Yeah, just uh, synthetic experiments we did. More questions? Yeah. So I wanted to ask a question about bias. Um, you know, in this, in, in the example that you gave, it's it's clear that the wave functions are only up down. But in the case where you don't know the what the wave function, I mean, what your solution might look like, how do you know that you're not introducing bias? Because if you Put in Gaussians, then you know you're going to get out Gaussians. It's like the classic: if you're looking for hammers, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> oh, that's a that's a that's a very good question. Uh, thanks. Yeah, so that's true. That's true. And but that's that's why that's why we're physicists too, right? We have some insights on on what the the physics is, and we are not just saying like, okay, this is an algorithm, and it's just gonna look for all possible solution. We we input some knowledge that we have on on the physics that we want to explore. And, and so, yes, that in some sense, that introduces bias, but uh, we always hope it's the good kind of bias. Just had a, cla just had a clarification question. Mm -hmm. So you created a neural, a reliable neural network to which you can feed a wave function, and um, it will tell you um, what the wave function is. So, so how are you going to use that? So you would actually... Am I mixing up stuff? So you, you can take the picture from the lithium ion experiment and feed it into this neural network? Is that what you want to do at the end? Yes, and that's what we are currently doing, not for the lithium, for another experiments. Uh, but yeah, so we feed the measurement of the single atoms. So that's not the wave function directly, but the wave function is some hidden structure underlying this data. And we use the neural network to extract this wave function. And, and there are many reasons why we want to do that. And, and one, one just on top of my head is that we can measure things that other are 
not accessible in the laboratory, say. Like uh, quantum entanglement is one example. That's a very, very hard thing to measure in the lab. It's a very non-local property. It has been measured in an experiment. It was like very, very uh, fiddle strength. It was like very complicated. And it's not possible to scale to a large system. So, but if you know the wave function, then you can compute things such as entanglement, for example. So that's one reason to extract information that are not accessible in the, in the original experiment. Uh, Giacomo, I think one of the last calculations you showed, you were pretty proud of the fact you did 150 electrons. Yeah, they were like uh, quantum spins. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, spins. Uh, and you got the wave function, yes. right? So where did you put it? In a neural network. It was... It, well, it, but, it, but wasn't that the thing that needed? It's essentially... I have to wait a moment. It's essentially what happened here. So we, it, was a, it's a, it was an Ising model. It was like a, like a simple quantum spin system. And we performed measurement of the, the direction of the spins, creating a data yeah. set. And then we trained the neural network and doing unsupervised learning. And by the end of the training, the neural network itself was the wave function. But I thought like two to the 150 required all the shipping containers. Yeah, it does, it does. But we, we, we don't store the full state. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's what I'm asking. No, yeah. here it was just a demonstration. So it, well, this is 12. Let me right? say, let me yeah. say, this is a demonstration just uh, to show. Yeah. But but the principle is the same. Even in this case, this I just printed this, the the full wave function, but I never store it in full. It's always compressed in the neural network parameters. Right. I'm maybe I'm explaining. You can produce any of those two to the n numbers you want. Like if you challenge them. And well, well that, that's what I'm. Yeah. I'm, so I'm, I, I, I can I can compute the wave function for any of those states because I have an explicit representation. Yes. So I can always do a big loop and ask the neural network to tell me what's the wave function for each state. And here I did the same and I finish all the state in a reasonable time. But I cannot do it for the 150 spins. So in that case, I can produce the wave function, but I can produce observables, say. Right. Like okay. So in principle, if you sort of waited long enough and computed long enough, you could oh, list yeah, out for all sure, the numbers. For sure. They I, are all there, but uh, but you're not printing them out. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I still don't know the normalization of the of the this distribution. So I could compute the unnormalized wave function, say. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, I actually had a question, which was, um, so it seems like there is a little bit of a knot to cut here, which is that you have a scaling problem where you can only simulate up to a certain size. Um, and that would be how you would get the data to train in the first place. Yes. So then if you go carry it over to, if the purpose is to go over a carry to experiment that's bigger than you could even simulate on the computer to see what it's doing, but how would you get the data? Or if it was data for a thing where you could scale, then why do you need the experiment? You know, like. Well, no, the experiment can always generate the data, right? Yeah, yeah, that part, yeah, definitely. So even if it's a larger system than what you can simulate in the first place, I mean, mm -hmm. that's exactly a point. Mm -hmm. That's uh, maybe, yeah, I should have made this clear, is that um, we want to be in the regime where we cannot s generate the data ourselves. We want to be in the regime that the experiment can, can realize that, can find this wave function because they, they have this platform, and... And we can use this technique to, to extract this wave function from the data. And that's, that's a regime that they can, they can always generate data. You can always, mm -hmm. always, if you have, uh, mm -hmm. like the, You can always measure the experiment. You can always measure, because what we use are very simple, like just mm -hmm. occupation number or spin magnetization. This is always thing that when you have this single, single mm, atom control mm -hmm. that you can achieve, right? And yes, I would say, yeah. Oh, I see. So this unsupervised one, you don't need you don't need the training data, right? Like, I mean, you don't need the synthetic training data. I mean, for the test you did, but from the experiment, you could just, just do it straight away, I guess, right? For the experiment, yeah, that's yeah. what we are doing right now. They, they're running an experiment, and they, they, it's a different type of platform. It's not lithium atom, but rubidium atoms. They are trapped with optical tweezers, and they can measure if they're in excited state mm -hmm. or ground state. Mm -hmm. They gave us the data, and we found the wave function. That's really cool. Yeah. OK, great. OK, we still have a little bit of time for more questions, if there are any. Uh, what is it that makes the 
What are the waveforms that make that pattern of reducing squares? Is it something about the lithium itself? Or Excuse me, you can. can, can, what, you can. can why do they make those patterns, the yeah, reducing that's squares? A, yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, this is like a, it's just the way that I plotted it. It was totally accidental. So uh, it's, just, it's just that there is, so this is, that's a good question because by, you can see this, the structure that is in the wave function. And it makes this square just because uh, I think, you know, by chance, this wave function at this structure, particularly. But that's one of the points I was saying that you don't need this, like, exponentially large number of parameters because you exploit some structure that is present. And this structure, you can clearly see it here. Yeah. Was it a ferromagnet? This was um, for, like, uh, uh, for the expert here, this was like a, a quantum quench at the time evolution of um, long-range uh, quantum ferromagnet, yeah. I thought I saw some ferromagnetic points. Okay. Yeah. Um, great, okay, one more question, or one or two more questions. It seemed from the graph where you had the two theories and you had the, um, the assignment using the neural network, and then there came the point where it really wasn't sure it had, it didn't have a lot of confidence um, so is that saying, it, would a reasonable conclusion be neither one is really explaining what's going on? And then if that's the case, would this unsupervised learning be able to provide you with some new theory that you could then go test? Or, or are you kind of back to the drawing board with like what's really going on? Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, yeah, so this is exactly that. So this tells you that the network has associated high probability to this theory, but they're really close to each other. So in this regime, you cannot definitively tell which one is correct. But if you if you ran unsupervised learning on this data, which we did not, and neither did they, but I hope this is going to be the case soon enough, then again, you could, instead of just validating a theory, you could extract the wave function of that, of the data, right? So, and of course, it carries all experimental imperfections, and you need to take that into account. You know, you, your reconstruction can only be as good as the data. So, but yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Okay, one more question. Great. I think maybe it was more than that. Forward. Yeah, right here. So on this one, the different colors. What are those? I know you said that those represented in terms of a certain number, mm -hmm. and I'm assuming you chose the scale in terms of like if yellow meant a certain number, mm -hmm. red a certain number, you know, hot, cold, whatever. Could you just kind of, I'm just thinking, kind of relating back to some of the coding we talked about this morning, and to realize that with a picture you can represent 4,096 different coefficients, and that you've got the color that represents. I think from what you said that the color goes with the number for the coefficient. Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, yeah, that's true. But but maybe yeah, I should have been more clear about this. This is not the type of data that we feed into the network. This is the wave function, and we feed measurements uh, perform on this type of wave function. But but if you, I don't, I'm just as uh, I don't know. Yeah, there are coefficients, but this is, uh, maybe I didn't understand the question uh, correctly, but uh, if you meant that we, these are the, the type of, like the pixel in the image that we feed? No, it wasn't that. It, it's taking the data to produce the pixel. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, it's taking the data to reconstruct these colors, essentially. Right. Yeah. So the blue might represent, like? Yeah, so in this case, actually, the, the, those numbers go from 0 to 2 pi. They're like a, kind of, that's all, it's just like a, uh, like, a, the, like a color map, essentially. Yeah, and then you have like free to choose them. Yeah. Okay. Kind of like Thank these you. are like the probabilities to generate different data that you would feed in, right? Like the colors would be like places you generate those, those are, different uh, kinds of pictures yeah, from. Yeah, essentially, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, thanks for all the great questions. That's, yeah, that's yeah, really that's awesome. That's great. Yeah, yeah thanks a lot. For <laughs>
Yeah, that was great. Okay. I'm 62 percent. So should be fine. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Sherry Harper, and I work with this group called the Contemporary Physics Education Project, and we basically do lessons and posters and so on with some contemporary topics in physics. And uh, we have a teacher's contest oh, for yeah. people who do uh, some of these topics like nuclear physics and particle so physics and so on in their classroom. And there are a few oh, yeah, papers really out when you're dropping off your um, when you're dropping off your survey. Yeah. And also, I believe they tweeted an announcement about it. Um, the deadline for it, unfortunately, is March 1st, so it's coming up. But um, there is a small monetary prize along with some of our materials uh, from the Contemporary Physics Education Project. So if anybody's interested, if you want to go to our website, it's www.cpepphysics.org. And uh, there's information about it on there also. So cpepphysics.org. And there's some information regarding that.